Good morning and welcome to the American Enterprise Institute. My name is Michael Rosen and I'm an adjunct fellow here at AEI. It's a great pleasure to welcome you here today for our keynote speaker and panel discussion on patent reform. And ladies and gentlemen, change is in the air. After five years of uncertainty and in clarity and frankly tumult in the area of patent eligibility, meaning what types of inventions are even eligible to receive patent protection, we are now possibly at a turning point where legislation has been proposed on a bipartisan, bicameral basis to, for the first time in 67 years, if I'm counting right, uh, actually reform Section 101 of the Patent Code to try to modernize it and bring it into sync with the needs of our times. And it's a great pleasure today for us to host Representative Steve Stivers, who has come forward uh, on a, again, a bipartisan, bicameral basis to propose legislation that would update and reform our eligibility laws uh, for the 21st century. Now, just a quick lay of the land before I introduce Representative Stivers. The congressman will speak. Uh, we'll then have some Q&A that I will moderate. Some of my own questions will open up to some audience questions. And then we're going to call up a panel of distinguished experts uh, at around 9 o'clock to engage for an hour in discussion of the, the eligibility framework and other areas of patent reform developments in the patent field uh, and prognostication for what may, may be yet to come. Uh, and then we'll have some Q&A also for, uh, for our panelists at the end of that session as well, and we'll wrap up about 10 o'clock. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce Representative Steve Stivers, who's serving his fourth term uh, as a representative for the 15th Congressional District of Ohio. Representative Stivers is a member of the House Financial Services Committee and is the ranking member of its Subcommittee on National Security, International Development, and Monetary Policy. One thing you'll note is Representative Stivers is actually not a member of the Judiciary Committee, um, and he'll, he'll be discussing how that came about, um, that, that even despite that, he's still interested in IP issues. Um, the representative before running for Congress served in the Ohio State Senate, and he's also worked in the private sector for the Ohio Company and Bank One, where he focused on promoting economic development and, encur and encouraging job creation. A career soldier, Representative Stivers has served for more than 30 years in the Ohio Army National Guard, and he holds the rank of Brigadier General. Without any further ado, Congressman General Stivers. Thanks, Michael. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Um, it's great to be here with you to talk about uh, patents and Section 101. Uh, and I'll just give some brief remarks. And uh, my staff is here. Anne Marie from my office spent a long time making some points. I'm going to turn them over now and just talk. So good job, Anne Marie. Um, but, uh, you know, patents are at the core of the competitiveness of the American economy. America is never going to have the lowest wages in the world. America is never going to have less regulation than other countries. But we ha what we have is incredible creativity and great ideas. And if we protect those ideas, then I believe we can continue to thrive as an economy. And if you look at the future, artificial intelligence, automation, innovation is going to be at the key of our competitiveness going forward. Uh, that's one of the reasons I care so deeply about patent legislation. Uh, I ran for Congress because I care about jobs and I care about growing our economy. When I first got elected, unemployment was, high, was pretty high. It was almost 10% in some of the counties that I represented. Uh, so one out of 10 people was out of work. Now, in almost every county I represent, it's near 3%. Uh, I think I have one county that's at four and a half. So I feel pretty good about that. But there's more that we have to do. And uh, we have to continue to have a system that works and innovates. So, uh, and Section 101 hasn't been updated since 1952. Just a quick show of hands, who was alive in 1952? Uh, I will note that there are three hands that are up, but it is, it is uh, 
Most of us were not alive in 1952. Think about how much the economy has changed since 1952. Think about how every single industry has changed since 1952. There were things in 1952 that you might not have envisioned. In 1952, people might not, might not have envisioned software because computers had these giant vacuum tubes. They didn't, we didn't even have transistors yet. So just you know, think back to 1952 and ask yourself, should we update our patent eligibility based on a much more modern outlook of, of what is patentable? So I'm looking forward to the discussion today. Uh, happy to take questions from the audience. We'll do that, I know, after we take your questions, Michael. But this is uh, a really important topic for the future of our economy, and that's why we've got to get it right. There is no rush to getting it done on Section 101. Um, we're trying to make sure we um, take people's feedback. There were three days of hearings in the Senate with Senator Coons and Senator Tillis, and all that feedback is stuff that we are looking at and trying to process and trying to look at our framework and change our framework based on the really important feedback we got from practitioners in the field and from folks who care deeply about our patent system. So I'm excited to be a small part of this. Uh, Senator Coons and Senator Tillis are great. And of course, uh, in, the, in the House, we've got Doug Collins and um, we've got um, Representative Johnson, so uh, Hank Johnson. So it's great to work with them. And I'm excited to try to make something happen here. But this isn't going to be something that you have to worry is going to happen tomorrow or in June or July or August. I think we're talking about years, not months. But I think, or year, hopefully we can get it done in a year. But it's, uh, it is really important and we're take, taking our time and trying to do it right. So with those, I'll just go on over and we'll go move to questions and make this thing happen. Thanks for being here, everybody. So that's what almost killed Alan Greenspan right there. That's awesome. You avoided the Oh, there we go. All right. <laughs> well, thank you again, Congressman. Um, and as you noted, both last week and the week before, the Senate conducted hearings on this eligibility framework. It did. Obviously, you're in the minority at this point, but do you have an understanding as to whether the, on the House side the, the Judiciary or IP subcommittees are going to be conducting their own hearings at any point in the near future. So I've talked to Hank Johnson, uh, I've talked to Jerry Nadler, they both are interested in the subject area and want to get there, but I think right now Jerry Nadler is a little more focused on IT than IP, and it, IT means impeach Trump, so <laughs> that's his uh, focus right now, but, um, uh, but I hope we get to IP soon, so that's... Uh, I, I tested that line with the staff this morning. They thought it was funny, so I figured I'd use it. See, it seems like IP would be more fruitful exercise than IT at this point. I think point, for everyone uh, right now, yes. <laughs> Very good. Um, and in your opinion, would the framework that has been put forward in your understanding, appreciating that you're not an attorney, but someone who has studied this very closely. One of the criticisms has been that this framework could potentially overturn the Myriad case, which had held uh, that genes, naturally occurring genes, are not patent eligible. Yeah. In your understanding, um, is that criticism warranted? Is there a chance that that might happen? Uh, so if that happens, it'll be because there's a drafting error, because it is no one's intention to do that. In our principles that we put forward, there were a list of things that we said we didn't want to do. Since then, we've tried to shift. And now, um, instead of listing things that can't be patented, the goal is to list concepts that can be patented to try to come at it from a much more positive standpoint. But I think we will ultimately end up, uh, and by the way, at the hearing, both Senator Coons and Senator Tillis, I will note, said that we have no intention of allowing genes to be patented. And in fact, if you look at our framework, it requires a couple things. It requires something to be new. Genes aren't new. The human genome has been completely mapped. Uh, it also requires um, that um, it, uh, oh, there's a second thing. I hate when that happens. But, but, it, but the new thing, clearly, right. it, you couldn't. And we'll probably end up listing some things that can't be patented. And my guess is something that occurs in nature will be listed. Uh, but let me note that one of the things that happened after, after the Myriad decision 
is that diagnostics could not be patented. And so diagnostic technology is almost 100% in China now, almost a, a monopoly in China. That's bad for American companies. I represent uh, Ohio, the Cleveland Clinic, wanted and still wants to invest in diagnostics, but they won't do it if they can't get patent protection. Um, and you know, if you think back to our Constitution, our, the drafters of our Constitution, in the base Constitution, before you get to the Bill of Rights, does anybody know how many times the word right is mentioned? Once. Hmm. So, and that's in Article 2, hmm. Section 8, Clause 8, and it talks about for the promotion of science hmm. um, and, and development of ideas, discoveries, they will give people an exclusive right hmm through the patent system for a limited period of time. Right. That is the only place outside of the Bill of the Rights that the word right is listed mm. in the United States Constitution. Kind of a big deal. So we've essentially, through a lot of bad, well, a lot of court decisions that have been interpreted on top of each other, you know, it was a good court decision to say genes can't be patented, but should diagnostics not allowed to be patented? I think they should. Mm. And frankly, all that information is now going to go to China. If you've done a 23andMe or anybody's done, done uh, the, um, um, the, human te the testing, all that stuff is done in China because diagnostic technology is almost a monopoly in China as a result of the Myriad decision. So we need to update things not to allow people to patent a gene, but things like diagnostics and where there's a meaningful new discovery that can actually uh, move our science forward, uh, we should allow it. And I think uh, we will make it clear ultimately that you cannot, um, clone, or you cannot patent a gene. And I, I feel confident that that will be uh, clear when we get to a actual draft legislation. Okay, great. And, and you touched on this along those lines, as, as you noted, Congressman, the, the initial outline for the draft legislation did include, I think, a list of five or six particular items, mm -hmm. fundamental scientific yep. principles, pure mathematical right. formulas. Calculations, yep. Exactly. Thing, things that, that would be off limits. If you, if, you if you delineate what is not patent eligible, then the implication is everything, everything else, else is. is patent eligible. Um, but as you know, that was where we started, but right. we got some criticism on that. So we pro we've changed and we're trying to talk about what is patent eligible. Uh, now, but my guess is, in the end, the only way to make this work is a belt and suspenders approach, where we will end up saying this is what's patentable, and then probably not in the statute. With the other problem is, in our drafts, we were going to say what's not patent eligible in the statute. Probably uh, in the legislative history, we'll say we have no intention to allow um, uh, patents on A, B, C, D, E, or right. some list there 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 will probably ultimately have to be a here's what can and here's what can't if you want to right. get to the right answer correct uh, you know in my in my experience as a practitioner it's always helpful to have those specific examples that you can analogize to to your case and my suggestion would be if there's an opportunity to to list those out even if it is in the the, the notes or the you know the committee uh, the committee correspondence just so we have a record it'll be of in the in be. the in the bill, the but in, in the non-statutory section, uh, legislative history that help, right. that the judges use all the time exactly. to inform their decisions. So I, I expect that's where we end up. And you know, it's important to know what's in bounds and what's out of bounds. And um, if you spell out both, I think it'll make it more clear. So that's where I'd like to see us go. I want, don't want to speak for Senator Coons or Senator Tillis sure. or Doug Collins or Hank Johnson, but that's where I'd like to see us go. And I think it just makes sense. Sure. Well, that's uh, that's good to hear. Now, uh, to go in a slightly different direction, on a, on a more personal note, how did you get drawn to this field of intellectual property, given that you're not a, an attorney by trade and you don't sit on the Judiciary Committee or yep. in the IP subcommittee? How, how did you come about so this? So I represent Columbus, Ohio. The Ohio State University is in my district. Battelle Memorial Institute that does a lot of innovation is in my district. And in an effort after the America Invents Act to uh, stop patent trolls, and there are patent trolls and there are bad folks in the non-productive folks in the IP space that are just profiteers. Um, there was a lot of work around non-practicing entities in a bill that Bob Goodlatte and um, Daryl Issa were pushing. 
um, and a lot of big techs people were pushing. The problem with that is if you're a garage inventor, if you are Ohio State or an academic institution, if you're the Cleveland Clinic, if you are um, Battelle Memorial Institute that just does the innovation piece and doesn't do the commercialization and, and follow it all the way through, they would have been defined as patent trolls. And that's what got me involved is hearing from constituents about that. They were very concerned about it. So I got involved and, and stopped what I think would have been a bad bill. And uh, as a result of that, met a lot of people in the IP space. And we started talking about, well, gee, why don't we fix the patent system? Because we were continuing to slide because of a lot of court cases. We'd had the best patent system in the world for 100 years. And then, you know, in the early 2000s, we started to slip. And we slipped to four, and then we slipped to 12. And we, uh, we never really have moved back, because while we moved back to number two, we're tied with 11 countries for number two. Mm. So, you know, by my math, that's the same as 12, which is worse than 11. Um, but that's true. It's, um, so we've got we to gotta make it better. And the Stronger Patents Bill is, a, is I think, a part of that. Uh, it will do a couple things. It will make the um, PTAB system and the court system um, consistent. And with the inconsistencies where there were um, less sort of protections in the court than you had at the PTAB meant almost everything that could be appealed was appealed. So the system that we built under American Vince that was promised to be quicker, faster, cheaper didn't live up to the potential that we told the American people it would because for many people it was slower, more expensive, and less efficient. And that doesn't drive innovation and that allows innovation to be more focused in just a few companies, sort of the Facebook, Amazon, uh, Apple, Netflix, and Google, the FANG group, if you will. Uh, and I don't think that's the America I believe in. It's not the America I don't think any of us, except maybe those companies, believe in. It, we need innovation to be everywhere. We need it to be on Main Street. We need it to be on High Street. We need it to be on um, Front Street. It needs to be in every town, uh, because that's what's going to drive uh, a, an economy that can compete with the rest of the world. So that's why this is so important. That's why we've got to get it right. Uh, injunctive relief is the other thing that's in the Stronger Patents Act, which is so important because for the little guy, if I steal that microphone from you, you can stop me because it's physical property and they take it back and they ultimately give it back to you. But if you, I steal your intellectual property, it is dubious whether I can get injunctive relief. Allegedly, it still exists, but it doesn't in the real world exist very often today. And so if you can't stop me from stealing your property, how do you have a, let's go back to the Constitution, how do you have an exclusive right if I can't exclude you? Without so that, that those are the argument, things right. that we're working on in stronger patents. But that got us to Section 101. I was at a conference with Senator Coons, I don't know, six, eight months ago, and we started talking about 101. And, um, you know, it hasn't been updated in 67 years. You know, there were three people in the room here earlier that were alive in 1952. Um, our economy's changed so much, we have to hit the reset button. And today, most patent attorneys look a little bit at the statute when they decide if they want to patent something, but they mostly look at court decisions because the statute is so outdated, it's not what people look at to see if something's patented anymore. And as a legislator, I kind of want them to look at the statute. I kind of want the statute to be clear. And, uh, and I think that's why we need to hit the reset button. Right. Um, and you, you touched on this. We'll take audience questions in a minute. But just sort of one follow-up. About a year ago, you and Congressman Foster uh, introduced the, the Stronger yep. Patents Act. Um, we haven't seen much action on that. Obviously, it was an election year. And now the House control has, has changed over. What do you see as the prospects for the Stronger Act uh, going forward? I feel really good about our chances to actually make something happen on the Stronger Act. Uh, you'll see an introduction here uh, before we break this uh, summer. Hmm. So um, at least that's our goal. Uh, we break on the 28th or 27th of July. So uh, we've got uh, five weeks, and we're really close at this point. We have... Uh, uh, a pretty good draft. We've made a few changes, but it'll be uh, language you will recognize, uh, not 
not all new, but a few changes and updates. And I feel really good about the conversations we're having with Judiciary Committee members. I'm meeting individually with our uh, Republican and Democrat members on the Judiciary Committee to kind of help them understand why we need this and why the economy needs this. You know, the, the head of the Patent Office has implemented about half of the Stronger Patents Act when I talked about the inequities between the uh, PTAB process and the court. Um, the Patent Office has actually implemented that part of the bill, and, uh, but they put it in rule. And so if the administration were to change, that could easily be washed away. We need the permanence of statutory protection for those uh, things. And, and in fact, when our ratings allegedly nominally went up from number 11 to number 2, part of what, why it said they went up was because of the changes the Patent Office had made in the PTAB process and making them consistent with the court. So mm -hmm. that has been seen as a positive. I think everybody sees it as a positive. There may be a few uh, outliers out there. In fact, I know who they are. So, uh, <laughs> but it's uh, some in this very room. <laughs> that's right. I'm sure. Yeah. But it's but we've. I think we've, we're moving the ball along with that. And I think the the patent office has helped us show people that, you know, if we were to enact the stronger act, it wouldn't be the end of the world because essentially half of it is enacted now, and um, the other half is is on the. Um, the injunctive relief, and then of course uh, the uh, demand letters, which are important too. And because there are people who abuse the patent system just to extort money out of people, and we need to we need to change some of those processes too to make sure that people that add no real value, you know, in the Constitution again, it talks about for the promotion of science. If you're just for profiting for yourself by being a parasite inside the system, that's not helpful. Right. So we do want to fix that, and I think the demand letter reforms we've got will actually do that. Right. Well, thank you. Why don't we uh, take some audience questions? We have a minute to, for, for a few, so I ask you keep your questions brief and respectful. Make sure they end with a question mark. So we have a microphone uh, here, sir, in the, in the front row. Yes. Sir? Here it comes. Oh, here it comes. Very quick and brief question. To your knowledge, are there any patent agents or patent attorneys in Congress? Uh, well, uh, Chris Coons is a patent attorney in the Senate, um, uh, and there are a lot of patent holders in the House, but I don't know of any patent attorneys in the House. I'm looking at Nick. Are there any? No. I don't think so. So Bill Foster, my uh, colleague and co-sponsor of the Stronger Patents Act, is a patent holder. Um, Thomas Massey's a patent holder. Um, Daryl Issa yes, was, right. uh, was a patent holder. Uh, so uh, we do need to rely on the expertise of practitioners in the field. Members of Congress are mostly generalists because, you know, and it'd be great if we had even one patent attorney in Congress, but because we don't, we need to learn from the people who know everything. That's why when we held three days of hearings in the Senate, we've taken that feedback and we're trying to incorporate, you know, Mike was one, Michael was one of the people who testified. Uh, we're trying to take those comments and incorporate them into the uh, concept that we've got because we probably will never have an expert on, on every bill we have that happens to sit in Congress. So we have to find experts from around the country, and then we try to listen to them. So that's what we've tried to do. Good question. <laughs> Here she comes. Oh, she's going the other way. You lost the lottery. Next time. Uh, Congressman Mike Waring, University of Michigan, thank you very much for your leadership on this issue. It's been great. Uh, yesterday at an event downtown, PTO Director Yonku made the point that in, in 2000, the United States accounted for about half the patents in the world with China and Japan and Europe being the other part of that. And as of last year, we're only down to 28% of the patents issued in the world. So speak to that in terms of how these, um, these changes you want to make are going to try to push back and try to encourage more U.S. patents. I will speak to it, and, and I think that part of it is the system is so expensive that it, and for little guys, they can be bankrupted. I've had two people come into my office that are from my district that are inventors that tell me they use trade secrets exclusively now because the publishing requirement, you know, the whole point of a patent is to further discovery. So there is a publishing requirement, which is healthy for, we want other people to learn from those discoveries. But the problem is 
China steals your intellectual property. And if you can't defend your intellectual property here and you have no injunctive relief, then when you publish it, you're giving other people the chance to steal it. And so more people, it's not that innovation's down in this country, it's that people are uh, protecting their innovation in other ways. Now they're using more, people are unfortunately avoiding the patent system and using trade secrets. And so if we can make the system uh, such that you, uh, your outcome is not determined by your pocketbook, today it basically is. So the rich guy can just bankrupt the little guy. I've used this example before, but if, if we had the system today and Thomas Edison was trying to do the light bulb, he would be bankrupted by big candle. <laughs> so we can't let the um, availability of somebody to have capital determine their ability to keep or earn a patent. So that's why Stronger is so important. Um, and frankly, on 101, it, it's, uh, that will result in more patents because they're, if you look at, let's just look at artificial intelligence. It's going to be one of the biggest innovations in the next 100 years. And because software is now unpatentable, and even software that does things, uh, a lot of artificial intelligence work is going to move to China. And that's why we have to look at, and I don't want somebody just doing math. It shouldn't just be computation. But if, if the software does something other than computation, then I think that should be patentable. Again, I don't want to patent a gene, right. but I think patenting a diagnostic is okay. On software, you've got a lot of smart people at the University of Michigan. I'm glad they're smart and not great football players. But, <laughs> Go Bucks. But, uh, <laughs> but, it's, but you know, they want, they're doing all kinds of stuff on software every day and artificial intelligence. And today, some of them are saying, gee, how do we, how do we you know, get paid back for this? And they won't be able to look today to the patent system in America. So if we update Section 101 and we allow more things to be patentable, that will increase patents. And if we secondarily, if we can uh, make sure that little guys don't feel like they'll be bankrupted by the system, then they'll file patents as opposed to using trade secrets. So I think those are some of the key things we can do to increase the number of patents. And therefore, the whole point of, of the patent system is to grow scientific discovery. It'll grow scientific discovery in America. And that is what's good for our economy, but good for society and the world as a whole. Okay, we've got time for one or two more, sir. Here, here Glad you microphone. got your question. I was. <laughs> hey, uh, my name is Dr. Benjamin L. Davis, and I am a patent attorney. Uh, my, fo my practice focuses on prosecution and drafting, emphasis on drafting. And this is what I got up at 2 o'clock in the morning and came from Harlem to tell you. <laughs> okay, Thank literally. you for being here. Yes, sir. So in my occupation, right, uh, we face two inherent but overlooked problems. That's the cause of all this 101 confusion. Okay. The first being practitioners who are writing incomplete applications that are not within the 112 requirement. And at times, these applications wholly recite prior art with very few novel aspects, and there's a lack of true innovation in those emerging technologies that everybody was complaining about, 5G, AI. Uh, proprietary uses of blockchains, bioinformatics, diagnostics, and the like. So innovation in these se um, sectors are narrow and at best are mere baby steps from the judicial exceptions in prior art. Okay, so for years, federal courts and the PTO actually worked together to ensure that the inventors did not overreach and take the commonly used things such as processes, yep. natural phenomenons out of the public domain, which would hinder work, you know, that yes. are just the basic tools. One more minute. As a patent drafter and prosecutor, I see the court's use of 101 judicial exceptions against these technologies as a statement on the lack of skill and thought needed to communicate high-level scientific ideals, tempered by the need to protect the public, and explaining how prior art teaches away from the same, which is not being done. Yep. Okay, so the current 101 changes are Pandora's box. Okay. Just be warned. Okay. That will further lower the writing quality of patent applications that created this mess. Right? So bad patents will issue in droves, but easily struck down by the court's continued use of the exceptions. Okay, any patent issued to those technologies that I just mentioned under the revised 101 won't be worth the paper they're printed on. They really won't. So their patent protection will be an illusion. So as you're going through and you're making this, uh, these changes to 101, 
I'm just saying, if you can do this, right, I don't know if you have the time to do it or not, go to the patent office, and for all those core technologies that were here earlier in the month, seek out the examiners that actually was prosecuting um, those applications. Yep. Sit down with the attorneys that actually wrote those applications, and it won't be the partner. <laughs> I can say that much right now. Yep. Sit down with them and find out why they were rejected, and they'll show you. It's not in and of itself, oh, one-on-one is bad or it's being misapplied or anything like that. As a person that's been writing these things for 13 years now, man, it is hard to do. Yep. And there is um, a declining premium on quality. So by making your changes, you're validating that decline and saying, hey, we're going to let everything through. Right. And, and that's not the goal to let everything through. I, I want to let you finish if you're oh, not no. done. Okay, thank so you, thank you the goal that. is not to let everything through. The goal is to take a step back. The fact that diagnostics cannot be uh, patented at all today is terrible for the United States economy. It is a bad decision. The fact that some software uh, cannot be, I don't want computational software to be patented, but we need to take a look at what can and what can't be patented. Uh, the goal is not to reduce the quality of the applications. The goal is to allow uh, things that were not envisioned in 1952 to be patented, because we have judicial interpretations of a code from 1952 when, when Dwight Eisenhower was president and the Korean War was either, you know, I, I don't know if we'd signed the, uh, the, the end of the, the Korean War or not, but, you know, the soldiers had come home, but uh, it was, so that, that's how long ago we're talking. And so there are a lot of things not envisioned. So I understand your uh, advice and guidance, and I agree with it. We don't want to reduce the quality but uh, let, go back to the Constitution again for a minute. Our goal is to foster scientific discovery and innovation. And I would tell you, one of the things you used, uh, you know, you said advances in these areas are baby steps. Baby steps are steps, though. And, and if something is new and novel but not big, then if you, a journey of 1,000 miles starts with a single step. So it, and, and, but the claim should be on the one step, not not try to patent the 1,000 miles. And, and if, a, if a patent doesn't accurately reflect what the scientific discovery is, it should not be patented. And Section 101 is part of patentability. So Section 101 is eligibility, and then there's nine more sections that determine patentability. So you can't, you know, it's Section 101 by and of itself is like the door into the breezeway, and then you have to get through all these other gates to get in the house. So, but, but it is important that our eligibility reflect um, as broad an opportunity as possible without having things that exist in nature or are computational or are basic science. I, I, nobody wants to allow those things to be patentable, at least among the four people we're talking about. Yeah. yeah. When that's possible, and, and if something's not new and innovative, it should not be patented. And that is the whole point of, if that's not fostering scientific discovery if you're trying to patent something that's not new, because that's not a discovery. If it already exists, you didn't discover it. Genes exist, you're not just discovering them. The whole human genome's already been mapped. Uh, so, but if, it, if you can use something to then be a diagnostic and say, this means you have this, that actually is innovative. So. Uh, I think if, if I can tell you you have pancreatic cancer from a test, that, that is, that's something that is, unless, the, unless it already exists. Again, so, but uh, there are certainly diagnostic opportunities and other things. So the whole point of Section 101 is to increase the ability of scientific discovery and grow our economy, grow our knowledge as a society. And, uh, and I, I think we need to take a look. I understand your advice, and I agree with your advice. We need to make sure the quality of these patent applications is, um, is high, and uh, I will take your recommendation, and I'll go down to the patent office and talk to some of these, these um, patent prosecutors and see if I can even meet with the, the drafters of them. And you're right, it might probably not the partners on, that actually draft the applications. Uh, but I will take that advice because I'd love to uh, 
dig in a little more. And you know, the, the other thing I want everybody to know is we are not rushing to pass a bill here. We are going to take our time, learn. It's important for policymakers like me. I talked to this gentleman earlier. I'm not a patent attorney, but I always look at the intended consequences and unintended consequences of every bill I propose or vote on. And I think it's important that we explore both. And you're bringing up some of the unintended consequences that we need to look at to make sure that we don't lower the bar. Nobody has an intention to lower the bar, but I do want to make the gate a little wider. Thank you. Okay. Congressman, yeah. thank you very much thank for you. your time. We Thanks, really Aver appreciate Thanks, it. Thanks, everybody. It's great to have you. Thanks, have a, uh, appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, we'll now change over, if you bear with us for a couple minutes, while we get the stage set up for our panel, um, and we'll regroup in, a, in about two question. minutes. Thank you. We're trying. Thank you. All right, well, uh, thank you for uh, indulging us as we move on to stage two, the, uh, the panel of our distinguished experts to discuss both Representative Stiver's um, pieces of legislation that he's introduced and also just more generally the, the field of legislative patent reform and other developments in patent law. And uh, we'll just run down the, the row here and introduce our, our panel. Uh, starting all the way at the end, on my, my far uh, right, is Phil Johnson, who's the chair of the steering committee for the Coalition for 21st Century Patent Reform. Uh, he was previously the principal of IP strategy and policy consulting at Johnson & Johnson, no relation, uh, where he also served as vice president and chief intellectual property counsel. He served as the chair of the board of the American Intellectual Property Law Education Foundation, President of the Intellectual Property Owners Association, President uh, board and board member of the American Intellectual Property Law Association. Mr. Johnson has frequently testified before both the House and Senate Judiciary Committees, including two weeks ago about eligibility legislation. Welcome, Phil. Great to have you. 
Uh, second, next to Phil, is Josh Landau, who's the patent counsel at the Computer and Communications Industry Association, known as the CCIA, where he represents and advises the association regarding patent issues. Mr. Landau joined CCIA in 2017 from Wilmer Hale, where he represented clients in patent litigation, counseling and prosecution, including trials in both the district court and the patent trial and appeals board. Before his time at Wilmer Hale, Josh was a legal fellow on Senator Al Franken's judiciary staff. He received his JD from Georgetown and a BS from the University of Michigan. So we've got a second, uh, at least second Wolverine in the Come house. Out. Welcome, Josh. Uh, next to Josh is Karen Norton, the vice president and senior counsel of the Washington Intellectual Property and Public Policy Office of Samsung Electronics America, Inc. Before joining Samsung in 2010, Karen was in private practice in New York and Washington, focused on IP litigation. She also served as an investigative attorney for the Office of Unfair Import Investigations at the U.S. International Trade Commission. Before becoming a lawyer, Dr. Norton earned a PhD in human physiology. She's registered with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office and is active in a number of bar associations relating to patents, international trade, and women in technology. Welcome, Karen. And last but not least, immediately next to me is Hans Sauer, the Deputy General Counsel and Vice President for Intellectual Property for the Bio Biotechnology Innovation Organization, BIO, uh, where he advises the organization's board of directors, amicus committees, and various staff committees on patent and other IP-related matters. Before taking his current position at BIO in 2006, Hans was the Chief Patent Counsel for MGI Pharma, and Senior Patent Counsel for Guilford Pharmaceuticals. Hans holds an MS in Biology from the University of Ulm in Sweden and a PhD in Neuroscience from Lund University in Sweden. Lund or Lund? Lund. Lund, okay, I said it right the first time. Uh, as well as a JD <coughs> from Georgetown, uh, where he currently serves as an adjunct professor. So welcome, Hans. Thank you all very much for joining us. How about a brief round of applause for our panelists to welcome them? And uh, let's just jump right in. So um, we have a number of questions where we're going to ask them of as many as people as we can, and then we'll hopefully still have some time left over for some audience questions as well. Let's start with you, Hans. What are the, the three most important changes that we should or should not make to the patent system? You can choose one from menu A and two from menu B, or three and zero, however you want to do it. Yeah, somehow it's always three that people are asking for. So people I'm going to remember three. Yeah, I'm going to yeah. try and give you three, uh, but I will duck two of them. <laughs> uh, uh, I think we will talk more about Section 101 as the panel progresses, but that is, I think, my number one important area. Second, uh, I don't think we should take our eyes off AIA trials, you know, in the PTAB. Those continue to be important, and while progress has been made. I think we, you know, we can continue working on those. Third, <clears throat> now this, this one's informed by my most recent experience in Congress. You may have heard there's a lot of legislative action going on uh, on patents in the biomedical space in particular right now in Congress. Uh, and, uh, and this comes to the area of where Congress, I think, ought to take a breather and reassess what it, uh, it is about to do. Right. Many of these bills that relate to drug patents in particular seem very technical and they're very focused on the biopharmaceutical industry and they deal with boring things like listing patents in the orange book or creating a purple book for biologics patents and when to delist them. Um, but other things only seem specific to the biotech industry when in reality they aren't. Uh, and, and I think they ought to be interesting to people outside our field as well. For example, uh, some of these bills create presumptions that the patent office for drug patents and only drug patents didn't do its job and couldn't possibly have done a good job. Right? We're seeing bills that talk about encouraging IPR proceedings for drug patents when they issue, right? assuming there must have been some kind of mistake by the patent office. Mm -hmm. Uh, we're seeing bills that uh, presume that the patent office didn't properly examine for obviousness type double patenting. So there must have been a mistake with these patents after they, before they issued. Um, or we're seeing presumptions of obviousness for drug patents <coughs> in legislation. 
But I think all this is directed as much at the PTO and creates a huge presumption that the patent office is incapable of doing a job in one particular technology area, but it also creates a presumption of uh, unpatentability for a specific class of patents of a kind that we've never seen in the US and that we really only see in other countries. But India has a presumption against drug patent validity, what no other country does. And we're about to do this in the United States. <clears throat> so that would be one thing I would raise Right. about Congress should reassess where it's going. Thank you. Karen, how about you? I think we're going to start the panel with some agreement. <laughs> <laughs> like last time, this was great. I know. <laughs> Fo uh, following up on what you just said, um, the number one thing that I wanted to talk about is that I think we are asking patent law to do too much. And I would caution uh, Congress and policymakers that patent law is not the solution to every problem that we have in the United States. And so, you know, for example, we hear a lot of talk about, oh, the United States is losing competitiveness to China, particularly in emerging technologies. So all of a sudden, we need to change patent law to fix that problem, rather than looking at other areas and other inputs to that particular problem. <laughs> I don't think that issuing more patents and filing more patent infringement suits is really going to solve that problem. When China is set to invest $350 billion in emerging technology next year, and last year the United States government invested $140 billion. So that is one example. Um, similarly, another example, which may be of interest to our university guests, is um, the investment in public universities, both on the state and the federal level, is declining every single year. And yet, we are increasingly demanding a technically trained and uh, technologically competent workforce. Um, I don't think that we can expect patent law to um, fill the gaps between what higher education costs and the investments that are being put in. So my number one my number one priority, if you would, uh, is to caution people that patent law is not the solution to every problem. And I agree that we should not begin to have patent silos, that this is the patent law for this particular technology, and this is the patent law for some other technology, whether it be on the prosecution side or on the litigation side. So, so much for the agreement. <laughs> <laughs> it was good while it lasted. Mm -hmm. uh, Phil, how about you? What are your thoughts on uh, potential, potential changes at a high level that we could or should or shouldn't make? Well, the obvious first change is the one we're really here to talk about, which is Section 101. Um, it's gone off the rails because of the Supreme Court cases. It should be returned to where it was 10 years ago. We operated just fine under the traditional notions of patent eligibility for 50 years or so. Very few cases. The Patent Office examined every application for utility, developed a good body of precedent along with the courts, requiring that inventions needed to have both a specific and a substantial utility. That is, they had to be practical. They, um, and obviously, uh, that was just the threshold requirement. You then had to go through, as the congressman mentioned, the gauntlet of proving that it was novel, unobvious, and that you had a sufficient description. So that's the first and relatively easy thing to do because right now that lack of patent eligibility, as we've heard, is really uh, quashing interest in research, especially, um, I would say, the more basic research, the more upstream research, which is more likely to run afoul of these newly created um, rules as to abstract ideas, natural phenomena, and so on. So that's number one. Number two, in order to restore confidence in the patent system and predictability, we need to do something to fix the fairness of the IPR system. The IPRs were not, as it ended up, um, 
implemented in the way I think many of the people involved with developing the AIA had in mind. I think the idea was that PGR would actually be the favored approach, the quick challenge, and that IPR would be a very limited um, challenge, really based on looking at the face of the patents that were cited if they hadn't been cited before, and if they had been cited before, they wouldn't be instituted. Um, and the, the feeling was it would be a very limited proceeding where the PTAB would look at the disclosures in the patents, perhaps receiving declaration evidence to prove that the disclosures were publications, and perhaps accepting some evidence as to what the disclosure meant to those of ordinary skill in the art at the time. But instead, it's become a wide open proceeding with expert affidavits that are hundreds of pages long, disputes of fact which the PTAB tries to resolve on a cold record, making credibility determinations off a cold record, which those of us who've been litigators know simply can't be done. And that coupled with other rules like uh, ignoring the, the, um, the patent owner's affidavits at the institution stage if they raise material disputes of fact, and other things, um, restrictions on amendments, and lots of other things have led to patent owners recognizing that this is not a, a level playing field. And they have no confidence at this point in the patent system because the kill rate in IPRs is so high, the expense is so high, and instead of being an alternative to litigation, which was originally contemplated, they're now adjuncts to litigation. Instead of being shorter, cheaper proceedings, what they're doing is, since 80% of them or more involve ongoing litigations, they are ramping up the cost of litigation, extending the time of litigation, and really making a mess of the patent system. Um, so we have to do something to fix them. We have to get it to the point that they're fair. So both sides come away from whatever that proceeding ends up being, and both sides feel that they were fairly treated on a level playing field, which is much more the way people feel about court proceedings. If you, you know, win or lose, the due process which is accorded in our courts is second to none, and litigants are comfortable with that. Now, it is expensive, but it is the gold standard, and there are lots of ways we could talk about fixing IPRs, but that's one of them. And finally, the third thing is we need to do something to actually restore the idea of providing inventors exclusive rights to their discoveries and inventions. Unlike almost everywhere else in the world, somehow, as a result of the aftermath of the eBay case, it's no longer practically uh, possible, at least reliably possible, to get injunctions to stop infringement. And yet, a patent is a wasting asset, especially if it's in the hands of a practicing patent owner. It is a, an extremely valuable asset, which is irreparably harmed by allowing others to come in and share the right. And if you go to places like Germany, China, many other places around the world, injunctions are readily available. And in fact, litigation settles more. It doesn't settle now because the, for an important patent, the accused infringer is able to start IPR, start litigation, play it out, and by the end of the litigation, the technology frequently isn't, is no longer relevant because it's moved on. And that's not a patent system that's going to encourage the investment, which we need. Because after all, let's face it, we, we are not, we're, we're putting money into basic research in the NIH, but not a lot. It's difficult to fund that, but the overwhelming funding of research is based on uh, the patent system and or trade secrets and or copyrights if you're in certain areas. And uh, these things are very important. They're important to our well-being. They're important to 
cures for the next new disease or for the current diseases or for many other things in our lives and to cut that off or diminish it, which is what's happening now based on having an unreliable patent system and the expense that's involved with it is, is really to um, forfeit a future which would be much brighter than it would be if we could fix these problems. Well, thanks, Phil. You, you, you raised, uh, in particular, the issue of, of, uh, of IPR and other patent office trials. So I'm going to go a little bit out of order here, and I'm going to ask you, Josh, to, to provide your sense of whether or how well patent office trials are, are working so far. Something tells me you may have a slightly different view than Phil's. I disagree Phil's. a little bit. I, I'll start off just by briefly addressing injunctions. I think the key here in looking at studies on this is that operating companies can still get injunctions. The people who can't get injunctions are licensing companies that only license their patents. That's no longer available to them. The reason that settlements have gone down is because they no longer have the interorum threat of an injunction to say, pay us as much as we can get out of you. So injunctions are working pretty well right now. If you're an operating company, if you make something, you can get an injunction. Which brings me to IPR, which is also working pretty well. It has brought down the cost of litigation. Litigation cost has gone down about 50%. That's in, even if you include the cost of an IPR, which is a order of magnitude less, you're still looking at a total cost that has gone down significantly. It's also brought down NPA litigation. Operating company litigation has been about steady over the last decade. NPE litigation spiked around the time of the AIA, then it came back down. What we've seen is that IPR and Alice in particular have been effective in bringing those down. There are concerns about what's going on with IPR right now. Um, for one, the Valve decision saying serial petitions, which are not a real issue either. I can go into a lot of detail on that and have. But the notion that if somebody else has filed a petition against a patent, you shouldn't be able to, is getting some uptick with the APJs on the board. That's a problem. I happen to believe that defendants should have a right to defend themselves. And if you are not working directly with the other company, you're not a real party in interest, you're not in privity. Those are the requirements that Congress put into the statute. There's no reason to extend that to, well, it's the same product, so we're going to say your IPR doesn't go. Beyond that, IPR is an effective process. It's a fair process. About 35 to 40% of patents don't make it past that first hurdle. If they do, a lot of them go away. But at the end of the day, if you look at the number of patents that actually, when challenged, are struck down, it's less than half. It's not this killing field that some people made it out to be. It's really a fair and effective process for looking, again, at whether a patent should have been issued. And let's be honest, uh, you know how much time goes into prosecuting a patent. You know how much time an examiner gets. It's not that much. I litigated. I know how much time I put into finding prior art for these patents. It's a lot more. There's always going to be that ability on the part of litigants that if we put the patent office, the obligation on them, patents would be way too expensive to prosecute for anyone, from the small guy to the big guy. That doesn't mean that the patent office shouldn't get a little bit more time. It doesn't mean the patent office fees shouldn't be going up. They probably should. There's good evidence that it would actually save people money in the long run because a lot of that cost is not the cost that goes to the patent office, it's the cost that goes to the attorneys. So if we double the fees of the patent office, you still see a significant savings overall for applicants. So there's a lot that we could be doing. IPR is working well, but there's a lot we can be doing with the patent system. Like Karen said, not everything should be patents. Some things are better suited by other mechanisms. But we can do a lot with the patent system. We can expand IPR to other areas like 112 that, let's be honest, why does a jury ever see a 112 decision? It's something that the patent office does. It's the technical aspects of the patent that should be part of IPR. We can do things. With 101, I don't think this bill is a good bill as it is. Maybe there can be something done with it. We'll see. Karen, any thoughts on, on patent office trials in particular? Yeah, patent office trials, uh, in our view, and we, we use them very frequently. We're always in the top three. Um, they are working fairly well. Uh, and I should note that we have been on both sides of the V uh, in patent trials. But we have found that they've been working fairly well. Um, one experience that we have had, however, which is somewhat problematic, is um, you, you may file a petition. Uh, the board institutes on a particular piece of prior art. Uh, the board, in its institution decision, accepts that it is prior art. 
The board does not raise any question that the reference is prior art. And then in the final written decision, the board decides, oh, that reference is not prior art, um, which comes as a surprise to you, uh, which also then means that you cannot appeal it to the board in the first instance, and it means that you have nothing in the record. Um, it is an issue that, uh, had it been raised earlier, um, certainly could have been easily taken care of. But since the institution decision suggested that this was a settled issue, you, as a practitioner, you have to decide how much reliance you want to have on that initial institution decision. Do you want to spend the rest of the proceeding litigating issues that you think are settled and spend your, your time and pages on the merits? Um, this can happen, this can happen on both sides of the V. It can also happen with claim construction, um, where an institution decision will set out uh, one particular analysis, and then in the final written decision, you get a claim construction that you've never heard before. And as I said, that can happen on both sides. Um, so I think that is one issue that certainly we have seen, and it would be, um, would be beneficial if we had more of an early warning system uh, that it would be an, an issue that we would need to uh, that we would need to address. Um, one other thing that I'd like to raise about IPR trials, um, there's been a, a lot of talk, and in fact, there's been a Federal Circuit case where a defendant has uh, gone through IPR. The Patent Office has uh, determined that the, the patent never should have issued; the patent would be invalid. Um, and yet, in subsequent litigation, the defendant is stopped from arguing invalidity, which it has won in the patent office, uh, in the district court, and is facing uh, the potential for uh, judgment with a district court jury. Um, while I think that that situation, while it has happened, I think that it will be rare in district court. However, I will say that one forum in which it does happen, and it has happened, is in the International Trade Commission. Because the International Trade Commission will not stay an investigation for an IPR. And in fact, the International Trade Commission has instituted investigations on patent claims that have already been found invalid by the Patent Office and have already been argued to the Federal Circuit. Um, under these these circumstances, uh, defendants have very little recourse uh, in the ITC. The remedy is so draconian and the procedures uh, go so quickly that even though they have won at the Patent Office, they are likely to win at the Federal Circuit, uh, they find themselves in a, in a position where they may need to settle uh, be, because they do not want to risk being banned from the U.S. market. And actually, that was going to be my point number three um, in answer to your question number one, that we should not lose sight of the ITC. Because as Congress and as the judiciary have been trying to rein in uh, abusive patent litigation in the district courts, the particularly non-practicing entities have found the International Trade Commission where the injunction issue is not an issue. The, ITC, uh, the ITC's only remedy is an exclusion order, which is tantamount to an injunction. And the non-practicing entities have found the ITC, and they are using the uh, remedy of the ITC as a cudgel to force more lucrative settlements than they could get compensatory damages in district court. And if I have an opportunity, I'll come back to that later, but I'll pass it on for now. Okay, th thanks, Karen. We'll, we'll come to we'll come to 101 in a minute, but I do want to give Hans a chance to to opine on patent office trials from the perspective of the life sciences community and or any perspective, but then in particular how you see it, and even you know as Congressman <coughs> Stivers talked a little bit about the stronger act and what what you see as potential uh, legislative fixes for any issues that that you your perspective has on. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Patent office trials. Well, I, I and I tried to do this short. Like the theme I heard, actually, and you know, I, I heard it in, in what you just said as well, 
is, you know, the question of inconsistent outcomes between the proceedings, which can work you know, to the disadvantage of, of defendants in district court litigation, but it can also really work to the disadvantage of patent owners. Mm -hmm. But so we still have, even though the patent office made a sincere effort, like on the claim construction side, we still have disparate, um, I think, burdens of proof and legal standards. So the first thing I think I would change about PTAP trials, right, and which leads me to the Stronger Patents Act, is we think the legal standards really ought to be the same, like to permit Congress to legislate a lower standard of proof in IPR and PGR proceedings, I think in retrospect was a mistake. It was a big mistake because the only thing that did in effect was it allowed the patent office uh, a fig leaf to reach different outcomes from questions that in some instances were already decided in district court. The patent office has invoked a lower burden of proof and a different claim construction standard uh, in cases where they decided a question of patentability in the opposite way from which a district court decided them. Both decisions from district court and the PTAB went up to the Federal Circuit and the Federal Circuit affirmed the district court saying, yep, you properly found this claim not invalid. Well, and then it got the appeal from the PTAB which found the claim invalid and the Federal Circuit said, yeah, that's correct too. <laughs> right? Because you have a different burden of proof. And anyone whose mind wasn't warped by law school says that can't be right. <laughs> well, one of them's got to be wrong. And we hear this from our, our business people. Right? And, uh, and we have to explain to them, yeah, boss, you know, what we, you know, th there was a screw up mm. during the legislation. We allowed this to be done on a lower burden of proof mm. uh, when we shouldn't have. Right? So I think the proceedings should have consistent outcomes. I believe a prerequisite to that is to have uh, the same legal standards. Um, a quick word, like from our perspective, um, we do know that empirically patents in our space uh, experience more multiple petitions than is the case in many other industries. So dealing with multiple petitioners at the same time is something that our members at BIO are quite familiar with. Um, I think the patent office is working through some of these questions. We think there are big remaining issues relating to joining time-barred parties. I think the patent office is misreading the statute there by allowing joinder petitions to be exempt from the one-year time bar. But people routinely show up in our cases that shouldn't be there because they've been defending a case in district court for way more than a year. Mm -hmm. but, and then some third party files an IPR petition, and guess who shows up after an institution decision? Somebody who wants to be joined. Right? Nobody understands the relationship between these people, about who filed the petition and who's joining. Right? And we've had instances where after an institution decision, the original petitioner drops out, and they get swapped in for the time-barred petitioner who joined, and we're off to the races. And then the IPR is solely between a time-barred party who shouldn't have been there, and the patent owner. And that, I think, is an anomalous outcome. Um, OK, so with that, I think that's where you know, I would focus conversation on PTAP proceedings. And, and that's that. And now you can take us to other subjects. OK, good. Well, no, thank you. We could talk about the PTAP mm -hmm. for all morning long into mm -hmm. the afternoon. But, uh, but I do want to talk about eligibility. Um, and, and Josh, why don't we start with you? Um, you were you you certainly attended some of these hearings. You've been following this very closely. Uh, from your perspective, what um, how how would you react to the legislation in general, and, and any reactions to what the congressman had had to say today about it? So I think the first thing I'd say is that I was very heartened to hear the congressman say that this is not a final product and this is not a. Uh a race to pass something, that there's a lot more work to be done, because I agree with him, I think there is a lot more work to be done. I disagree that there's a tremendous necessity for this. The idea that there's a lack of clarity over what 101 means, there's a very good clarity over what 101 means. 88% of decisions get appealed, that get appealed get upheld. Judges are pretty good at figuring this out. If you ask a practitioner, and this was a test a Stanford student did, if you ask a practitioner, give them one minute and a claim. You don't give them the spec, you don't give them anything else. No prosecution history in one minute, two-thirds of the time they're going to be right. That's pretty good for a minute. If you ask them to do more, they're going to be able to do significantly better. So the idea that there isn't clarity, I think, isn't the right question. 
The question is, do we like the outcomes? Do we like the results? And I think what we see is that in industries impacted by Alice, so I'm leaving Mayo and Marriott aside, in the industries impacted by Alice and Bilski, we've seen significant growth since those decisions. Those decisions haven't harmed investment. They haven't harmed innovation or research and development. They've had the opposite effect. They've probably incentivized companies to shift money away from litigation defense and defensive patenting activities into productive research and development. So setting aside whether there's a need in the Alice impacted industries, I think the evidence is pretty clear there isn't. The question is, are we gonna get a good result out of this bill? I think it probably is less clear than what we have right now. If we're worried about disruption, we're talking about a decade of fighting over what field of technology means. We're fighting over a specific and practical utility because either it means what Phil alluded to, the useful standard in the past, which is nothing, which is you can't patent cold fusion and perpetual motion, or it's something new, in which case we're gonna to have to figure out what that means and that'll take a significant amount of time we could have just spent focusing down what the current 101 tests mean. So clarity is not a good excuse for this either. And the congressman alluded to you know, novelty as an issue in 112, so 102, 103, and 112. 101 has a different function than any of those. 101 is about separating between pure science and the useful arts. So the Constitution is discover, uh, sciences and the useful arts. And the useful arts is the grant for patents. Sciences is actually the copyright grant. So if we're worried about the useful arts, we want to make sure that we're not patenting basic research. We're not pat patenting abstract ideas and business methods. We're patenting actual technology. That's 101's function. So even if it's something that's totally new, we don't want to allow it if it's not truly a technology. And if we're just cloaking this basic idea, this abstract idea, this basic research in a thin veneer of technology, that's not beneficial either. The point of this provision is to keep those out in the first place because they're the basic building blocks of technology that we need for research. So what we need to do is make sure that those are not patentable and they're not patentable through the draftsman's art. They're not patentable just because you have a good patent attorney. They're just not patentable because they shouldn't have been patentable in the first place. So that's, I think, what the goal of this bill has to be. I think having a discussion about what 112 should be doing is helpful. The provision that's in there really just codifies current law. It's nice to see it but it isn't gonna change anything. Things that aren't patentable right now under 112 still won't be. Things that are patentable under 112 still will be. So seeing that doesn't move the needle on terms of 112 taking over some of 101's role. So we'll see what happens with the bill going forward. I'm glad to hear that there is a, a path forward that isn't just what we've seen. All right, thank you. Phil, do you wanna to react to that? Well, first of all, the utility requirement is not just perpetual motion machines. I'd commend to those of you who are patent attorneys looking at the manual of patent examining procedure that the patent office uses in applying both the specific utility and the substantial utility tests and to the cases, and there are quite a few cases from over the years that have interpreted and applied those tests. So for example, if you have um, we talked about genes. Everyone agrees you can't patent genes as they exist in the human body. But even if you isolate a piece of DNA and you have no idea what it's useful for, very clearly it has neither a specific nor a substantial utility as applied using the patent office guidelines and wouldn't be patentable either. Same is true for intermediates with no known utility of themselves and so on. Um, there are lots of different categories. The Patent Office has rigorously applied these, um, including, for example, saying you can't just say, well, this w might be useful in medicine or this might be useful in some other field. So um, I commend everyone to looking into what those requirements really are. And they did serve us extremely well with very few disputes for more than 50 years before the Supreme Court decided to uh, limit eligibility. I do agree that what we're talking about is patenting things in the useful arts. And I think the useful arts um, is a good you know, touchstone for the practicality that we're talking about with patents. We're not talking about uh, doing, as the congressman mentioned, just mere calculations and so on. I think that 
to be patentable, something should be useful. And the current proposal um, requires that. It requires that it have a specific and practical utility. I think I would prefer to see it say, instead of in any field of technology, I would prefer it to say in the useful arts, because I think that would be more in keeping with the traditions of the patent system and completely congruent with the authorization of the Constitution. I also believe that people tend to overlook the uh, requirements that, the specific requirements that it be a machine composition and so on, which is recited in the statute that's retained. A major step forward is eliminating the word new from Section 101 because Section 102, which is directed to novelty, is far more precise and in, in fact, that is the way novelty has always been applied, and it will eliminate the confusion that the Supreme Court seems to have had, and other courts seem to have had, by injecting novelty considerations into eligibility. There should be no question about novelty raised when you're talking about the threshold. It either is the kind of subject matter that should be patentable, or it's not. It could be old, but still be the kind of subject matter that you could patent. But being, being eligible doesn't mean it's patentable. That chair is patent eligible, but not patentable because presumably it's in the prior art and known. And people confuse that. And people also, unfortunately, have intentionally confused some of these issues by throwing out examples where the example is based on prior art. You know, we shouldn't be able to patent the use of that chair. Well, you can't patent the use of that chair. It's in the prior art already. It's not a patent eligibility issue. So um, I do think that the provision, as it's written, I'm not talking about the 112 provision, but the 101 of one provisions are a big step forward. And we'll get rid of judicially created exceptions, finding no basis in the statute whatsoever and will re return patent eligibility law to where it was for the starting 60 years ago till about 10 years ago. And what will the result be? And this is the important part, because you, you know, don't talk to me about how easy it is to kill patents and IPRs when at places like the University of Michigan and around the country, what's happening is research money is not being spent not being attracted and not being spent to develop great new ideas that could revolutionize the way we live, how we live, how long we live, improve our productivity, raise the standard of living. These things are what's important. That's what the patent system is about, and that's what needs to be reinvigorated. There is, in fact, not money going into areas that it used to go into. And I think anyone with practical experience in this field knows it's very hard to take an early stage idea that's going to require a lot more investment and find venture capitalists now who are going to invest in it based on patent protection because patent protection is simply no longer reliable. Karen, do you want to react to that? And in particular, um, I'm curious to hear your thoughts and, and Hans's thoughts on this idea of separating out the novelty from the utility requirements, which at least in my opinion, that conflation has been very problematic um, from, the, from the perspective of trying to resolve these cases at the right time. Well, Samsung has, has not gotten itself involved in the 101, uh, 101 debate. Um, so we, we have not taken a, an official position on 101. Um, one thing that I will say, and again, it's in, in the um, context of being a caution, I think what has spurred uh, much of the debate and much of the discussion is the breadth and vagarity of claims that have been at issue in some of these cases. And so, for example, 
uh, finding a specific correlation between a marker and a disease state is, could be very useful. Um, certainly, it could be novel. Um, but the problem being that what is, what is claimed is essentially any use of that correlation. So if we are looking to the patent system to promote the progress of science, we should not begin by privatizing knowledge. Hans? Mm, uh, oh, <clears throat> well, let me start with this. Like I read earlier <clears throat> that apparently today is the fifth birthday of the Alice decision. I wasn't quite aware of that. Mm. But so, so, how timely, right? Happy well. birthday, Alice. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. it's uh, five years <clears throat> old today. Yeah. Behaving like uh, a five-year-old. Uh, I also read that apparently this past week the Supreme Court denied its, I think, 43rd cert petition on Section 101. So here's a court, I don't think, where we can expect any more guidance. There are two cases, though, where the Supreme Court is showing interest. That's the Berkheimer case and Vanda. the Vanda case. So two cases that actually didn't end badly for a patent owner, those are the only ones where the Supreme Court is signaling interest. Why? So maybe we're going to get more guidance from the Supreme Court. I don't know if it's going to be good guidance. So my first proposition on Section 101 would be, I think Congress is right to show an interest in this area. And the legislative straw man proposal that we're seeing at a minimum signals that Congress uh, you know, fields that may be defining the kinds of things that can even be considered for patenting ought to be Congress's prerogative rather than an exercise of the courts which are construing common law exceptions that don't have a doctrinal origin in any congressional enactment and where we clearly see courts not only asking for help but also actively construing the exceptions and not the statute. Right? We, we really do feel that insofar as clarity is concerned, um, I think it's belied by too many members of the judiciary and, and of the patent office who are all saying, you know what, you know, but for the guidance we have from the Supreme Court, you know, we would like, uphold this patent, for example, because we think that's the kind of thing that ought to be patentable, right? Um, be it as it may. <clears throat> On Section 101, uh, when we were talking earlier about utility, I think to me that's, that's another good example of where I think we can learn from like Josh and their clients because in the biotech space, like, uh, we teach a whole class of util uh, about utility when we teach pharmaceutical patent law, right? And our technology, it really bites where we've had like really leading decisions on utility that go far beyond the proposition of not being able to patent doomsday machines or perpetual motion machines. Uh, so, so to us, our reaction to the proposal and the redefinition of utility was actually significant. We felt this was you know, potentially a really big deal right? and something that we want to explore further with Congress. I think it's an, a significant element of the legislative proposal. Uh, we heard a lot during testimony, people asking for the first time about the appearance of the terms uh, in any field of technology through human intervention. Right? That's new. I don't think we've had that in the patent law so far. We th I think human intervention was always implicit right, in things that are patentable. Fields of technology are new to the Patent Act. Um, but I don't think they're really new to US patent law. At least this last time I looked, we signed TRIPS. But TRIPS uses those exact terms. So whatever it is that we give patents on in the United States, it at least includes fields of technology. But maybe we give patents on some things that aren't in fields of technology. That's going to be an interesting exercise to go through with courts. But at a minimum, I think talking about fields of technology is going to be responsive to people who are worried about patents on dance moves or proposing marriage, right? You know, we've heard a lot about that. Uh, at a minimum, maybe that could be pointed to and said, you know what, those patents would probably no longer be covered because dance moves are an art, right? They're not technology. And proposing marriage, I don't know, for some people it can be really technical. <laughs> but, uh, or an art than a science. Or an art or a science. <laughs> 
right. but nonetheless, right, so I think you know there's so there's something significant going on there that we're well advised to pay attention to. The other thing, real quick, on section one twelve f right Senator Tillis, I think at the end of the hearing said among the things recurring themes he heard was everybody he used those words, everybody had concerns of one sort or another about the Section 112F proposal. That's certainly true, I think, for what I've heard from our bio membership as well. Mm. We've had, I think, more concerns and hesitation because it's new right. and hasn't been debated uh, than about any other provision. Right? So that clearly is something we need to work through. Uh, I think, Josh, you made a really interesting point. You said the things that are patentable under 112 today will continue to be the things that aren't won't become patentable under this, so what does it do? Uh, I think that's, that's worth debating. I think in the first instance, this Section 112 rule is first and foremost a rule of claim construction, what, and not substantive patentability. I think it will tend to work almost universally towards narrower claim scope. It's gonna put more work on infringement instead of validity during disputes. Right? But I think it could also lead to unexpected findings of invalidity that you didn't see coming. Mm -hmm. Because courts are going to look at this, they're going to start construing the claim mm -hmm. under this new section 112, and then the court's going to say, well, and now that we've determined that that's what the claim means, now we're not going to find it enabled, or, or whatever. Right? And suddenly, boom, yeah. you have an invalidity that you didn't see coming because that's not what the claim meant when you started the litigation mm -hmm. or when you drafted it. Uh, so I think this is going to be a great discussion about Section 112, if it goes anywhere. But what, at a minimum, it signals, though, and it's the right signal to send by the legislators, is that they, I think, earnestly want to be responsive to the concerns from high tech, from e-commerce, and from the software sector. I think they're really trying to do something, I think, for your constituents there. And, and this is something I think we should help them work through. Because other than otherwise, I don't think this will become law. We have to be responsive uh, to Josh and his constituents on this. Oh, thank you. I'm going to take okay. I'm going to take audience questions in a minute, but let me just do a quick speed round um, in honor of Alice's birthday. So thank you for pointing that out, Hans. Uh, one of the issues that that I discussed in my testimony was whether we could have saved a tremendous amount of heartburn if Alice had been decided on obviousness grounds rather than 101 grounds. In other words, to say that this, this patent on third-party risk management or hedging uh, software could have just been decided as obvious, maybe we wouldn't be in the, in the mess that we're in now. But let me just ask in, in a, a yes or no, followed by a one-sentence explanation, did you think that Alice was correctly decided? Phil? No. Any, any, any one sentence explanation, or you, you want to pass on that? Well, it, it just created so much uncertainty that I, I think there was any other way it was decided would have been better. Okay. Josh? I'll surprise everyone and say yes. <laughs> Shocking. Uh, it serves the purpose of saying, even when you have something abstract or uh, natural phenomena, any of those, if you cloak it in technology with just generic things, if you don't do anything innovative, you just take the natural phenomena or the abstract idea and encompass the whole thing in a minor bit of technology. That's not what we are allowing into our system. So it was correctly decided. OK. Karen? I will agree with Josh. All right. Hans? As far as the result goes, I imagine the Alice case could have gone down on summary judgment for 103, obviousness. It might have cost a little more, but not very much. The case might have gone a little longer but not very much, and we would all be better off, and the defendant would have gotten what they want. Okay. Great. Well, I have a lot more questions for you, but I want to give the audience a chance to ask, so let's take some audience questions, and you can always uh, fold some into that. Yes, sir, and we'll have a microphone, and again, brief, respectful question mark. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Uh, my question pertains to the Barrio pharmaceutical sector. Um, and some of your thoughts on proposed legislation that uh, could undermine the incentives to innovate in, the, in that sphere. Um, for instance, Senator Graham's proposal uh, to create a presumption of obviousness for extensions and, and innovations on existing drugs, um, or uh, Speaker Pelosi's proposals to um, uh, 
uh, with regard to arbitration and price controls and things like that. So just whatever your thoughts are. Thank you. Uh, so I feel <laughs> may, maybe just a real quick crack. Uh, so a lot of patent legislation that's directed at drug patents specifically, I think some stand out like for, for being having particularly the potential to create disincentives. Those are the ones that choke off either patents at the beginning. Right? I do think we need a lot more discussion about creating presumptions of unpatentability or invalidity just because somebody gets, let's say, a second patent relating to a drug or just because the patent covers a drug, period, right? and nothing else. So th that, I think it is a problem because it affects the system at its entry point. Why we're not talking the end game of pharmaceutical patents, we're talking companies that need to get a patent because they're a startup company and they need a patent to attract investment and because it's in their business plan. If they go to the patent office and the first thing they're being told is, oh, what technology are you in? That's presumed unpatentable. But the burden is on you to show why you should get a patent at all. I think that's going to be a problem and it affects like all of our members, not just the big ones who have established products. Uh, the other thing, um, so there is legislation pending where uh, that, that blatantly talks about compulsory licensing you know, for reasons and under circumstances that we've never had in the United States and that we only see in developing countries like Malaysia, India, and other countries, right? The kind of thinking that is pervasive there has taken hold among many members of Congress who are frustrated by being unable to solve problems in healthcare costs in the United States. Patents often offer themselves as a simple solution to what's really, really a complicated problem. Mm. Right? And, and before you know it, you will have very simple, simple bills that say, uh, the federal government should negotiate as the sovereign uh, with companies about what price the federal government is willing to pay. And if the company doesn't agree to take the price the government cares to offer, then we will just compulsory license uh, these bills and we'll all be better off, won't be. Uh, the bills really are that simple. But they attract a lot of support in Congress, and, and we were not having a conversation about what kind of signal that sends to innovators. Because last time I looked, before you can worry about how to price a drug, you must first have one. Um, and, and we all know what, it, you know what the risk is and what the cost is. Currently, we have a good thing going in the United States on the innovator side. The U.S. originates more new drugs than the rest of the world combined. New drugs become available to U.S. patients, often years before they become available in other countries. Nobody objects to that, right? But, but we need to think about what the effect will be if we start sending signals that if we don't like your price, after you've, pro after you've brought it to market, we'll just give it away, right? And take away your patents and give them to anybody who wants to copy your stuff. <coughs> Thank you. Yes, sir. Hi, I, I wanted to uh, go back to injunctions. Um, uh, I, I think Mr. Landau uh, suggested that you can get injunctive relief uh, as long as your model is not licensing your patent. And I just wanted to drill down on that a little bit and maybe ask for others to comment on this. There are a number of companies in this country that are well established and reputable that uh, licensing patents is their business model uh, and universities license their patents. Uh, it, it seems to me that there's a lot of people left out of that uh, scenario and maybe we should be looking out for those folks too. So what I would just address is the study that looked at that that I was referring to. A university is in a different boat than the sort of pure licensing plays. A university typically is licensing to a company to put into production and is sharing in that investment. Typically that company is part of the case in some way. That would be considered an operating company in that study. The licensing companies are companies that the only reward they get from their patent is a monetary reward from the license of their patent and they don't have the sort of partnership with a company that universities tend to have in tech transfer and spin-off situations. Anyone else want to address that too from the perspective of how do you draw the line between a, a licensing company, an NPE, a research institution, a university? Hans? Really quick, I, I don't think it's easy to draw the line. I think many people feel there is one somewhere. 
Uh, and I, I really do believe, I think it would be helpful for Congress as it debates what to do about patents to take a little time and study as one aspect of the system the, uh, I think the secondary, the universe of secondary actors in the patent system, right? So we've had, we have uh, patent licensing businesses, we have patent aggregators, we have patent brokers, uh, we have litigation funders, we have, uh, I think, a business model that uh, I don't think existed in that form 20 years ago. Uh, we have, on the other side, we have patent like defensive associations. Uh, we have groups that bring IPR proceedings, right? So there are many new secondary actors, which I think contribute to a dynamic in the system uh, that still baffled many people. Right? And I think sometimes they contribute to more patent enforcement that wouldn't otherwise be happening. I, I, I believe that's true as well. And I don't think Congress and many other people like fully understand like the diversity of activities that go on in that space and, and are unable to make up their minds about whether that's good or bad for the system. Uh, I think it deserves a conversation. Um, what, and, and that's all I have to say about that. We actually suggested it at the FTC's hearings that that is an area that might be productive for them to look into. We'll see if that happens. And I, I, would, I would actually uh, agree with, with that, that this needs more attention and uh, more discussion. Um, as you know, to bring it back once again to the ITC, <laughs> which is my favorite subject, um, the, the essentially uh, automatic injunction in the ITC um, is something that is being used and abused um, by these patent aggregators and non-practicing entities. Um, in order to force uh, more lucrative s settlements than could, would be available in compulsory licensing. Um, one other thing that I would say about injunctions is it, it's very easy to talk about an exclusive right. However, when we look at the world that we live in right now over the last 67 years, um, what you see is you see with technology, things are becoming more and more uh, complex, more and more uh, multifunctional. So for example, the thing that half the people in this room spend their day looking at can have up to or over 250,000 patents. Um, saying that if you have a patent, you should be able to enjoin um, these devices that may contain 250,000 distinct inventions. Uh, in my view, is not promoting the progress of science, but actually impeding it. And I think that that's also something that needs to be kept uh, in mind when discussing these issues. Thank you. We have time for one more question, maybe. We're, we're over time already. Anybody else? Right. Well, on that note, I'd like to thank our panel for very informative and helpful debate. I appreciate you being here, and uh, thank you all for coming today and hearing about these important issues.